Welcome to Flourishment, the podcast on living life as you were meant to, so you can flourish. Welcome, everyone. I am so honored to have with me today Arlene Pelicane. She is a speaker, author, media personality, and blogger. She's written seven books and has appeared in major media outlets, including The Today Show, Focus on the Family, Fox and Friends, Family Life Today, The 700 Club, The Better Show, The Hour of Power, Turning Point with Dr. David Jeremiah, and Homemade Simple on TLC. I'm so excited to have her with us today to talk about raising kids with faith roots and respect. Thanks so much for coming today, Arlene. It's wonderful to be with you. Thanks for having me, Tina. Arlene, how do we get victory in our households? I know a lot of people are struggling to feel like they have some sense of order in the chaos. Yeah. What is it that helps them when they're feeling like parenting is so very hard? Yeah, I kind of, right when you ask that question, I think of three things. So the first thing is prayer to say, Lord, open my eyes, show me what needs to be done here. Like sh- convict me of sin. Show me if one of my children needs to be, you know, just help us change our hearts, help us to get on the same page, pray scripture over yourself, over your kids. So start with that prayer. Um, the second thing is the attitude because sometimes our attitude is like, oh, I'm going to lose. And whenever our attitude is, oh, I'm going to lose, you do lose. So, you know, obviously the kids once in a while or more than once in a while, it'd be like kid one, mom zero. You know, you feel like, or dad zero, you feel like they're winning, but the attitude needs to be, this can be solved. You know, instead of, I remember uh, in our neighborhood, we were watching these, all these kids, the young kids riding without bicycle helmets. And my husband had asked one of the parents when he saw him like, Hey, you know, my we had a really bad accident on a bike and it was really helpful that our second grader was wearing a helmet. So my husband told us this story and said, what you really need to have your kids wear helmets. And the, the other father said, I just can't get them to do it. So this is this attitude problem. Like, you know, like I'm a grown man or a grown woman, right? And I can't get this two, three, four, five, six year old to do it. So the attitude, so pray, straighten up that attitude to say, wait a minute, I do have the victory. I am the adult in this situation. And then the third thing is really getting new tools. Like if you find that, okay, I have a, I'm trying with my attitude. I've prayed, but it's just, I'm not moving forward. Then you need more tools in your toolbox. So whether it's, I need to really plug into and to listen to more podcasts about parenting, or I need to pick up a book about parenting, or I need to take someone out to coffee who has kids my same age, but they seem to obey. Like, how do they do that? So you need different tools because if you have all the same tools and nothing's working, then you've got to know, Hey, you know, I, I need to get something different. So that would be my first suggestion for just getting back on track and feeling victorious as a parent again. Well, that sounds like three suggestions to me, setting that foundation spiritually to be strong and then changing your mindset, which flows from our spiritual strength and then getting the tools. What are some of the favorite tools that you suggest when you're working with parents or advising parents through your writing or your speaking? Yeah. One of my favorite tools is not doing too much for your child to fix their problems and letting those natural consequences fall. So when your child, you know, let's say it starts at breakfast and you have a young child and you serve the child cereal and the child's like, no cereal, I want toast. You know, that first movement that you make to say, oh, okay, fine. You don't want to have the cereal. Mommy will eat the cereal. Here's your toast. So now all of a sudden, that's how our day is going, right? That the kid is going to now tell you, your lovely child of cherub is going to tell you what to do the rest of the day. So one tool is just simply saying, no, you know what? I've already poured your cereal. It's a natural consequence. I've already poured your cereal. It's already done. You may eat that or you can go hungry. It's up to you. And then all of a sudden, it's not all, you're not the one taking all the orders, but obviously you're benevolent, you're providing for your child, you know, so, so it's just the idea of natural consequences. Oh, 
you don't want to do X, Y, and Z, well, then I guess you won't be able to watch any TV today. Oh, you don't want to help mommy, you know, in, in with these chores. Well, then I guess we won't be having any dessert tonight because how am I going to have time to make the dessert if you won't even help me? You know, things like that. Um, another thing is we as parents, we uh, explain a lot. So instead of saying, take out the trash, we say, you know, everyone's got to do chores around here and it's so helpful and, you know, it's getting kind of stinky. And if you could just do me the favor and take out the trash, that would really help me out. Okay. So, you know, in the next few minutes, if you're able to go ahead and take out that, you know, we like ex over explain. So I think one of the wonderful tools that we all have that we don't necessarily use is just those short commands. It's time for bed. And believe me, I've got to work on this myself, but uh, I think husbands, uh, fathers are typically better at this than, than the mom, but not always, but using those short instructions and using natural consequences, that's a great place to start. I love that because you're empowering your child to make good choices when you're treating them like someone who knows there's this decision and that decision, and there are consequences of either one that yes. actually helps your child be a better adult. It really does. It does. And then, you know, and it, it also helps what ends up happening is we escalate because they're not doing what we said for them to do. So now we're, we're getting upset and, and we're yelling and we're doing all these things. And so when you make things simpler and take the emotion out of it, you know, you're also fostering that respect in the home where you're respecting one another by the way that you talk to each other. Right. Because you can lovingly set those boundaries. In fact, boundaries are better reflective of love and courage than not setting boundaries. Correct? It's very much true because those boundaries, they keep you safe. You know, you think of uh, just a boundary of, uh, I, I shouldn't use this example because I know nothing about farm animals, <laughs> but you think about the sheep and they've got their pen and they've got their boundaries. And that gives them a sense of safety because they know I can roam anywhere within this space and I will be safe. And it's the same idea. Sometimes we think like, oh, we don't want to be overly strict with my ch children. Maybe you had a really strict parent and you think to yourself, I'm not going to be that parent. I'm not going to be that strict parent. But your kids really flourish when they know this is what expe is expected of me. I'm supposed to go to bed at this time at night. I wake up usually at this time in the morning. These are the responsibilities. I have all those things. They help a child to be respectful in their families because they feel safe and they also know they have responsibilities and it, it really boosts their self-esteem instead of tearing it down. And it's more realistic. You're going to have to deal with boundaries in life. If you raise your children to have a sense of no boundaries, a sense of entitlement, they're going to have a struggle when it comes to trusting God's boundaries as being for their good. Absolutely. So what are some things that you can talk about with regard to setting faith as part of the foundation in your home with your children? And how does that make them become better adults? Absolutely. You see, you know, when Moses is talking to the children of Israel, he's saying, be careful to do what the Lord commands. And if you do what the Lord commands and you keep your heart towards God, then all these blessings will follow you. Right. But if you don't do these commands, then all these curses will follow you and nothing has changed. That is still true. So for our children to learn the Ten Commandments, to honor them, you know, to think I'm going to that begins at a very early age with honor your father and mother, you know, things like that. So the idea is how do we like weave this in? So is it, it isn't just like, OK, one hour on Sunday, we have our church and we see that. But then the rest of the week doesn't jive with this whole faith thing. So a lot of it is a challenge to us as parents, like, Lord, how can we diligently seek you in our everyday life? And then your children watch you and then they pick up on that. Oh, okay, look, look at the kind of movies my parents choose to watch. Look at the way my parents use their time. Maybe my parents volunteer for something. Maybe they don't just go to church, but they are active in an area that they like, you know, whether it's singing or ushering or serving in kids' church, whatever it is. And so I think a lot of it is just realize that it's something that's caught, something they're going to observe in you. And it's a wonderful reminder to us as parents to say, man, help me to flourish in my faith so my kids can watch me and also flourish in their faith. And then the other thing is 
it's it's caught, but it's also taught that it's also something on purpose that you are teaching your kids. And you know, there are many people much much better than I am at this of the whole family devotion thing. But one thing I would suggest when your kids are young, make it a priority to end with a Bible story. So you know, when your kids are are even you know one, two, three, etc. So you're ending and you have a Bible story, and it's a wonderful way to have the habit of putting God's word in your day every day and a beautiful way to go to sleep. And then, you know, now I have a 15 year old and I don't sit next to him and read Bible stories <laughs> anymore, but he'll read his Bible on his own at night before he goes to sleep because it's a habit that he just grew up with and it was easy for him to adopt. So we cannot make our children believe in God, have faith, you know, all these things, but we can try to create as much as we can an environment where their faith will flourish. And maybe for you, it's the morning time, um, oftentimes at breakfast before the school day or even in the summertime or when the kids are off, you know, with my girls, I have my oldest is a boy and then I have two girls. So with my girls, I'll do like a five minute devotion over breakfast together. So it's, it's having moments where you're taking advantage of that time to implant faith whenever you can, sharing stories of faith from the Bible. Because it'll weave throughout your entire day and all through your conversations if it's how you live. It's how you live and what you say. Yeah. And I really think finding a place to serve is very important in this so that it's it's because that's just a, a, a part of, uh, I think it's a part that's missing in many families because we have all our activities. But if you really look at your activities, what is service oriented? And so to look back and think, okay, how are things we can do? So one thing that we loved is in our elementary school, which is a public elementary school, we have a sunshine club, which is like a Bible club after school on Fridays. And what we loved about it was it was our way to serve our school and, and our community, but it was something we could do together as a family. Like we all could serve and volunteer together. So look for those opportunities, whether they're a regular thing, or maybe it's every Christmas, you do something special like with Angel Tree and you you uh, deliver gifts to children of prisoners. Angel Tree um, is a ministry that does that with prison fellowship. So just be looking for those ways to serve with your family so that they have things that they can remember. Oh, I know what that looks like because I've done that before. And let's talk about how service impacts the character development of our children. Yeah, I, I think it just helps us realize I actually feel a lot better when I help others, <laughs> you know, because something that is so pressing for kids today is there's hockey stick growth with depression and anxiety. And a lot of that stems from just soaking in your own feelings, right? But when you go to serve someone else, all of a sudden you feel better yourself. And so I think a wonderful antidote to all the depression and anxiety we are seeing in kids and teenagers and tweens is to get them out in the community, in your churches, serving, whether it's tutoring, whether it's serving food, whether it's serving at a basketball camp, like helping someone else, whether, you know, but in their gifting, you know, something that, so don't make it like awful that they hate it, but something that they, you know, that doesn't have to be their favorite thing in the world, but something they can do and feel competent at and that it's helpful, whether it's a garage sale and you're going to send the, the money to missionaries, whatever it is, but be thinking of how can we think of others? Because in so doing, your kids are going to be able to be blessed themselves. How is it that all of this is connected with our emotional well-being, our spiritual well-being, and our relational well-being. And that connects to our physical well-being as well, doesn't it? Yeah, so we are a whole person. Sometimes we like to divide it out like, okay, we've got the physical side on one side and we've got the spiritual side on the other side, but it all works together. And I think that's really good because sometimes we can be too spiritual and then we neglect all the other stuff or sometimes we can make it all physical and real and what we see and we totally neglect our soul and our spirit, which is so utterly important. So yeah, I think they are all connected and that they can intermix, right? It's, there are many activities that can involve all of these things for our children. I love that you come at this from a multidisciplinary approach, a whole person approach that is so healthy and so well balanced. Let's talk about the aspect of how a marriage between two parents 
can help the children have a better sense of well-being in the home. And that's whether they happen to be step parents, adoptive parents, a blended family, or anything like that. Yes. And you know what? I want to just say, if you are listening and you're in a blended family, go listen and find Ron Deal and Family Life Today, because I just interviewed him on the podcast and he uh, talked so well. So it's familylife.com slash blended. And they have so many things for blended families because the, the regular family with the mom and the dad and the children already have so many challenges, right? But now when you add a blended family, now it's okay, I have to get used to my stepmom or my step sibling. There are so many other things that are happening there. So for the marriage to be secure in a first family, that brings those children security. But when the marriage starts to become front and center in a step family, the child kind of feels threatened. Like, hey, you're sitting with my mom and my mom used to sit with me and now she's sitting with you. So it is interesting that marriage, it has a different place depending on what family you're from. Now, having said that, still over time, having a strong marriage is going to bless your child, whether it's a stepchild or not. But one word to the step families before I, I go the other side. Um, one thing that I've heard from Laura Petherbridge, this smart stepmom that's really helpful, is keep those habits with your biological children, whether it's like, hey, we go out for pancake breakfast every other week on the weekends. You know, keep that habit where it's only you and your biological child or children, something. And that will help that child not to feel like they lost you you know, that they lost you to this new person, you know, this new spouse. So that's something that could kind of ease in the, the expansion of the home to include that new spouse. Now, I think for kids that it's their, you know, it's their original mom and dad, when they see their original mom and dad getting along, I think that does wonders for them. And in fact, I think that we need a lot more of that because, you know, here I am, I've written these books, 31 Days to a Happy Husband, 31, you know, all these things. And my husband will say, hey, I feel like the kids get all the good stuff and I come home and you don't have anything left for me because I no longer have those emotional needs because I've already connected with my children, right? But my husband, he's coming home and he hasn't connected in that way and he'd like time. So how interesting. So even for all of us, we've got to recalibrate and think, okay, so maybe that means, so one new thing we've been doing is after dinner, the kids will do the dishes and then my husband and I will take a walk around the block with the dog. It doesn't happen every time, but many times it does, right? And that's a way to show, hey, the marriage is important. Spending time with you is important and we'll carve time to do that. So you've still got to date. You've still got to do all those things because that strong marriage, don't be afraid to have your kids stay with a babysitter, you know, and think, oh, the poor children. No, those children, your children need to have a mom and dad who still connect with each other outside of being parents, and that's gonna give them a lot of security. I really love that you're focusing on helping parents model healthy relationships for their kids so that their kids can help develop their own healthy relationships yeah. as adults. How can single parents do this when they don't have a relationship to model before their children? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I've asked um, single parents this question and different people. And one thing that comes up is finding friends who are married, who have a good, healthy relationship, and maybe they have children the same, similar ages as your kids. Maybe your kids are already friends and doing things together so that your children are exposed to another married, you know, a married couple. So they see like, okay, this is how this could work. You know, it works beautifully when the kids are all friends and then you come together and whether it's dinner together or to go bowling together or you go out to the movies together. And I know that can be awkward for that single person because they're like, oh, I'm the single person and the other person's a married couple. And that's why I think it's super important as married couples, if God brings single people into our life and we can incorporate them in activities to look for those kind of opportunities to be open to nurturing those kinds of relationships. And then for that single parent, when they're talking to their kids, I know it could be easy to be like, oh, you know, marriage, marriage is hard. It's really impossible. You know, it's easy to kind of 
be negative or maybe for your kids to catch you complaining about, you know, your ex-spouse or complaining about the lot in life they, life they had, et cetera. And so that's one thing as, as a single person, just to get before God and maybe get the counseling you need to be able to talk to about marriage in a positive light like to share, Hey, these are some of the things I wish I would have done different. So it doesn't have to be all rosy, but you know, these are things, but I believe that marriage is a good thing. I believe that you can get the help. You need to have a wonderful marriage. And I really want to support you in that. So that single parent is still a champion of marriage, even though their experience with marriage was not the best. I love that. And I love that you're inviting parents to feel open to going to counseling, which is another thing that parents can model for their children. When you're emotionally in crisis, make sure you seek help so that kids know that that is not something that we should have a stigma against, but should be open to doing just as much as if we would go to the doctor when we're sick. That's right. Yeah. I have one couple, they love to say coaching. We are going to our coaching and that's just fine. I think that's fantastic. What advice can you give to the parent who wants to grow as a leader in their family, but doesn't know what to do? Yeah, I I would say, you know, to that parent, especially to the father, that maybe he knows how to lead in his business, but when he comes home, he feels like, oh, I'm inadequate. You know, I like, I do everything wrong. I do the laundry wrong. I like the, I do the baby stuff wrong. I do the teenage stuff wrong. I don't know what to do. And so to invite that, uh, and it could be a husband or a wife, to take that, those same principles that work in business right? And to just kind of brainstorm, how might those leadership principles still work in the home and transfer them over just for a new point of view? So maybe it's, hey, we need to have like a little progress report in the same way I would touch base with an employee to say, you know, here's what's going on. Here's what you're doing in your job. Well, here's what we need to improve on. What do I need? You know, you can do the same thing with your children. Uh, I remember Jim Daly from Focus on the Family saying he does the reverse uh, progress report where he asks his son, you know, okay, give me a grade as a dad and tell me how I'm doing, you know, so it can be just kind of thinking in these ways of how can you implement leadership. So a lot of it might be you see areas in your children where they need, they don't know how to do the next skill. So maybe you're frustrated with your children. They're not responsible. Well, maybe they haven't been taught that. You know, we had a little thing just the other day when one of our children put some glasses from the dishwasher into the cabinet and they didn't fully dry them. And so there was a, like a little ring in the, that, that formed on that wood in the cabinet, right? And so you realize, then you, I realize as a parent, well, I've never taught you that. I've never taught you that, hey, I've taught you put away the dishes, but I haven't taught you, hey, make sure the bottoms are dry so that in time it doesn't form this ring in the cabinet, right? So, so look and say, what are things I need to teach my children? Because I, I'm afraid that in our iPad-driven world, we've become very passive. It's just like, okay, let's just let our kids be okay. Let's uh, let them be entertained. Let's let them be out of our hair while we do our thing instead of, hey, my kid's in fifth grade and this is what they need to learn. Or my goodness, my kid's a sophomore and these are the things they're going to need to learn before going to college. So I better start teaching them. So leadership is anticipating what's that next skill that your child needs and how can I teach them that skill? My husband loves this phrase, um, don't wait, create. And the idea is don't wait for life to just throw them a curveball, but create the curveball in your own home so you can talk about how this is. So this looks like when your child is two, let's go out to the street. Okay. Now, if you go out to the street and you go together, look at that, a car is coming and you back up, you know, so you're creating these situations instead of just waiting for them to all of a sudden see this thing for the first time. So I think those are wonderful signs of a great leader. And a great leader says that is not afraid to say they're sorry. A great leader isn't afraid to say, you know what, I gave you social media and I see that it's really been a negative thing for you. And that's my fault because I gave it to you too soon. And I'm really sorry. And we're going to try to fix this. Now your child isn't going to be like, Oh, wonderful. I happily give up my Instagram. You know, it's not really not going to happen, but the leader is willing to take the heat for the wrong decisions. And the leader is also willing to say they're sorry when they've done something. I love that. And for the parent who has a teenager now, and they have not implemented these boundaries so far, and they're feeling like a failure already 
is it too late for them to start setting some of these boundaries and implementing healthier home habits? It is never too late. That is the story of God. There is always a second chance. Even if your kids are in college, they're grown adults. I mean, it's, it's not too late to build a bridge to your children. It's not too late to ever apologize for something. Uh, so, you know, if you have kids that live under your roof, it's not too late for you to implement change, for you to say, you know what? I've been thinking about this uh, and I, I've seen, you know, and, and really make it so that you're communicating to them, you flourishing as my child, as my teenager, as my young adult, that's super important to me. And I see that this is something that's holding you back. And so I'm going to make a change. Now that child at the moment is most likely not going to be very receptive to that change that you are making in their life for their quote unquote good. But hopefully in time, they'll look back and they'll say, you know what, you really rescued me there from something that was really harmful to me. And so don't be afraid to even at a late stage in the game, say, you know what, it's really important that you sleep like for four hours in a row. So I'm going to be collecting your phone at 11 p.m. and you can get it at breakfast time. And you know, your kid is not going to like that if you have a teenager who's been sleeping with their phone. But what you've done is said, this is a boundary that I think is healthy for you, for you to be able to get a good night's sleep, and I'm willing to take the heat for it. So it's not too late. You can do that. And of course, the earlier you start with your kids, the more natural and easy it's going to be for you to make those changes. What about that parent right now? And I think a lot of parents are in this situation at this time where they feel completely overwhelmed. Everything's in chaos. They feel like there's so much crisis. They are experiencing this oppressive attack of failure messages against them. I can't do this. What are some parting tips for that parent who feels completely overwhelmed and as if there is no way they can succeed? Yeah, it's almost like it, it reminds me of Dave Ramsey and the snowball thing he talks about. He just talks about if you have some crushing debt, like so much debt, and you just don't know where to start. It's like that in parenting, so much debt, like you just don't know where to start. And you start with one credit card in that scenario and you whittle it down. And it's the same thing in parenting that you start, okay, what's one principle? What's one idea that if we were to do it, it would really feel good. It would really help us out. And you just do that one thing. So maybe it's, you know what? We are going to have dinner four times a week as a family. You know, maybe that hasn't been happening. And so that's your one thing. You're going to be like, whatever happens in my world, we are going to have dinner four times, device-free, everyone around the table four times a week. And that's it. And once you get that and you get that down, you're going to be like, oh, we did it you know, we made a change. And then you're going to be like, this is great. And now you have momentum on your side. Now you're gaining a little bit of confidence. Now you have a little bit of hope that things can change. That's so important, that window of hope. Because when you feel like everything's overwhelming, you have no hope and you don't move. And so my encouragement is pick something really specific. So, you know, if you did it, make it doable. Don't make it the hardest thing ever, you know, make it something doable and then allow yourself to win so that you can have that hope and momentum. Okay, good. We've got that four days down. Now we're going to move to five days. All right. Now that's supernatural. That's easy. Let's do something else. Now we're going to start the exercise thing, you know, and so you just get it one thing at a time, feel like you win, have the momentum and make that habit as easy as possible to continue. Take that elephant in bite-sized pieces, right? Take it in bite-sized pieces. That's right. That's such great advice. This has all been so helpful and so insightful. I know a lot of people out there are going to want to stay connected with you. How can they find you, follow you, and get in touch with you for all the amazing resources you have to offer? Yes, my website is arlenepelican.com. And on that website, you can take quizzes like, is my child getting too much screen time? Um, I also have a Parents Rising video series that you can check out. And so lots of different things. And I also have a Happy Home podcast, which is on accessmore.com. Thank you, Arlene. This has been an incredible blessing. I hope all of you stay in touch with her and come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Mm -hmm.